This week on Nevada Week, Election Day in Nevada is over, but Election Week in the Silver State continues. Support for Nevada Week is provided by Senator William H. Hernstadt. Welcome to Nevada Week. I'm Amber Renee Dixon. Nevada's election results, why did they seem to take so long? As of this taping on Thursday morning, November 10th, only one of the four Nevada House races has been decided, with Republican Representative Mark Amaday handily defeating Elizabeth Mercedes Krause in northern Nevada's 2nd Congressional District. So. Why the delay in the state's other top of the ticket races? Here to discuss that and more are David Demore, Interim Executive Director of the Lindsay Institute and Brookings Mountain West, as well as Chair of the Department of Political Science at UNLV. April Corbin Gurness, Deputy Editor at the Nevada Current. Dan Lee, Associate Professor of Political Science at UNLV and Jessica Hill, politics reporter for the Las Vegas Review Journal. Thank you all for sharing your time with Nevada Week. Nevada getting results on election day. Is that a thing of the past, David? As long as we're going to go with the mail, yeah. Um, in particular, you saw, you know, 2020, right, emergency procedures first time through. Last time you have efforts to clean it up in the legislature, but extending the acceptance of ballots through Saturday it ensures that we're going to be here at least till Saturday. Okay, so there are mail-in ballots used in other states. Why is Nevada one of the remaining couple, handful, as of Thursday, in which we don't have definitive results, Dan? Right, well, so a lot of states actually have theirs, they have to be received by election day. So that's one difference. We just need to have a postmark by election days, and we're accepting it through Saturday. So, you know, that's one big difference. The other difference is... It's just we're a swing state. We have a lot of competitive races where these mail-in ballots can actually make a difference. And we're especially seeing this dynamic where uh, Democrats especially use it. So we're seeing this same thing in 2020. Republicans take the lead. Re Democrats are trying to make a comeback. So we got to wait for these mail-in ballots to come in, right? So the, all those things are, you know, contribute to, like, why we're waiting around uh, past Election Day. And the other part is just simply administration, right? Our structure was set up for early in-person voting and early in an in-person Election Day voting. Now you're transitioning to mailing, right? It's going to take much longer to process. You need more staff. And then, obviously, dealing with the just the onslaught of ballots this time around. You've heard Joe Gloria talk about that, that <laughs> there's just so many that so much work that has to be done when to, to, to process a mail ballot compared to so many votes in person. Is this a resources issue? Are you hearing that, Jessica, from Clark County, Washoe County? You know, we haven't heard that. Uh, someone on Twitter did say something about how there's a resource issue, how Joe Gloria, um, he said that that's not an issue. He has never heard of that. The department is fully staffed and operating, and they're doing the best that they can as quickly as they can legally. Are you hearing anything, April? Um, not really. The people who are upset about it are people who want to call the races. They want to know the outcome of the races, right? But like Clark County in particular has never missed a statutory deadline for county ballots, and that's what Joe Gloria has said over and over again. He says, we don't care about the media pundits and the TV shows and their deadlines. <laughs> they care about the, the statute, the when the votes have to be counted, when they have to be finalized, when they have to be certified by the Supreme Court. They make all of those deadlines, and they're on track to make those deadlines this year. It's just just frustrating for people like us who are waiting and watching and wanting to know those results. It is important to clarify that. I say yeah. a delay in results, but technically, legally, it's not. It, mm -hmm. it's not. They have until, I mean, when do they have until to certify these results? Uh, what is the actual? It's going to be it's Friday it's, the 8th. Yeah, it's the, the actual, yeah. So we have we have a ways. <clears throat> and there's yeah. a whole other process with canvassing, uh, you know, making sure that those signatures are verified and that's gonna take a little bit of time too, like through Wednesday. Okay, so let's start off with what we have left to count. Mail in ballots. Um, what what are we waiting on? When do we know 
those are going to be in and we have to have them counted by. What was that deadline? So we're waiting for the mail-in ballots that were submitted on Election Day. You know, you could turn in your mail-in ballot into the mailbox on Election Day and it'll take a while for it to come into the department. Uh, the Clark County Election Department is also working on counting those ballots that were dropped off at drop boxes on Election Day as well. Uh, so we have like un an unknown number of mail-in ballots that, you know, were mailed on Election Day that uh, Joe Gloria doesn't know how many yet. Um, but we also have around like 70,000 ballots that were dropped off on Election Day that still need to be counted. These mail-in ballots, who do they tend to favor? Clearly the Democrats. Um, you've seen, at least in the, the releases from last night, both in Washoe and Clark, two to one for Cortez Masto and a little, little less for Sislak. We seem to be running a little bit behind Cortez Masto there. But that goes to Dan's point about the sort of polarization on how we actually now cast our votes. Oh my gosh. So then it's, if it's going the same direction as in 2020, Republicans look like they're leading, then it goes more towards the Democrats. Are we going to have issues of election fraud claims? Right. So that's probably probably going to happen because the way it looks now is between the top of the ticket races, gubernatorial and Senate race, it looks like um, there's a good chance that Cortez Masso could overtake Laxalt. And right, and he was in the center of the 2020 aftermath, right, leading those uh, you know calls for uh, or claims of voter fraud. So I imagine he's going to do it for his own race, losing this race. Um, so. You know, he might call for a recount, but I mean, in addition to that, definitely, I think, I don't want to say definitely, but it's pretty likely he's going to, you know, raise some lawsuits, bring up some lawsuits. I think it's a, t a tougher sledding, though, right? Because you now have this in statute, it's in NRS, they clean that up. And then if you end up with split outcomes, how do you explain that as voter fraud, right? If you have, you know. Right. Party. But the claim is like, well, Lombardo could have won by more. <laughs> so, you know, yeah. so it doesn't necessarily call into legitimacy, you know, because if you're going to blame, for instance, if they focus on these mail in ballots again, then that's like where, you know, they just, the Democrats just expanded their lead, you know, in, in both races, right? So Lombardo could have won by more. It was pivotal in Laxalt's race where he lost because of it, he, he would claim. So, I mean, I don't know. It just seems like, to me, the most likely, if I had to choose what's going to happen, I, I see lawsuits. Polls have shown that Lombardo had better likability among his own party than Laxalt had among his own party. So it kind of, these results that we are seeing does make sense. Um, so it'll be interesting to see what Adam Laxalt does after this. However, he has said that um, among some pressure, he said that Joe Biden is the legitimate president. And then he also told the RGJ that um, he would accept the election results. April, in your opinion, mm -hmm. would it have helped Laxalt had he never questioned the results of the 2020 election? Or um, was that helpful for him? You know, I mean, he rode the Trump wave, so I think it was helpful at the time. It was in 2020, he was right on there. And, and we saw after the 2020 election and then January 6th insurrection that Laxalt went quiet for a really long time. Like he sort of like fell off the radar for like a solid six months, at least publicly. And I think a lot of Republicans were doing that at the time because they were trying to see whether or not Trumpism was like dead and we're over it because they just, you know, <laughs> tried to storm the Capitol or if it was going to come back. And I think it's come back and, and he's ridden that wave. I mean, he had a solid primary challenger who uh, I think was a little less Trumpy than him. Um, clearly, it, it served him there. And I, and I think that's just part of his brand and who he is, for better or worse. You know, in the Trump wave that we're talking about, where does that stand now in the, in the days after this election? You know, certainly the pundit class is sort of saying this is the end of Trump and DeSantis has now been sort of anointed as the sort of heir apparent to that. Um, you know, certainly I think you, know, you look at some of those candidates that he backed. They were mm -hmm. problematic and, you know, we've seen this not just this cycle for the Republicans. You go back over cycles before where they put more extreme candidates in in races that they should have won in favorable environments. Um, that's a problem that they have. Um, you know, you, in, what the solution is that is, we shall see. You know, some I think some of the good news for the Republicans is you see this infusion of sort of new, new, new uh, leadership in the party. You see some new House candidates, some younger candidates there who are going to be not tied to to this sort of Trump model there. So that gives them some hope there. But at the end of the day, it's going to be closely divided in in the, in Congress here. Um, and all, and all of a sudden, we're going to start talking 2024. <laughs> Before you know it. Uh, Mail-in ballots, as you said, tend to favor the Democrats. But as of this Thursday, two days after Election Day, 
uh, it may not be enough to get incumbent Democratic Governor Steve Sisolak to retain his seat. And it seems to be he's the lone kind of Democrat at the top of the ticket races that would not be uh, retaining the seat. What do we think is behind his possible loss? Yeah. Dan? I think you can look on both sides. Like, what's good about Lombardo and what's bad about Sisolak, right? Mm -hmm. So Sisolak was governor during the pandemic with the shutdowns, hurt the Nevada economy, right? So a lot of people uh, kind of have negative views towards him based on, you know, his COVID response. Um, and then you look on the other side, Lombardo, again, comparing Lombardo versus Laxalt having more favorable, higher favorability among Republicans. Also, you can imagine among independents because he distanced himself, at least for most of the campaign, more so from Trump than Laxalt mm -hmm. did. Um, so, right, so in, in, on both ends, I mean, that's just contributing to why uh, Sislak's more vulnerable. Like he, you know, his uh, approval lower, Lombardo's approval higher, mm -hmm. especially among independents. So, that's where we're at. And you also have to look at the other Republicans at the top of the ticket. I mean, our Secretary of State uh, race, the Republican Jim Marchant, is an election denier who like has said on the record that he wants to get rid of early voting, which is like massively popular and been around for decades, right? Like that's pretty extreme. You had an attorney general candidate who told people that her opponent should be hanging from a crane. Um, <laughs> they were some pretty extreme candidates. Um, and, and I think that speaks to what is prob probably going to be their losses, whereas Lombardo doesn't have that. You know, he is really also a blank slate. Like, he has, he's in office as Clark County Sheriff, but he hasn't, you know, passed laws or done anything like that. So it's like high name recognition, and we actually don't know what kind of governor he's going to be, which is probably attractive to people when the governor was on TV for a straight year, you know, talking about unemployment and all of those things, which, you know, may not be his fault, but if you're at the top of the, you know, the government, you're, you're going to get blamed for that. He's got way. a record to look at. Yeah, yeah, and I think, you know, just pick back off that, it's, the point is he's been electing Clark County twice uh -huh. um, before. So he's a known entity here. Um, I think that's one of the reasons why the Republicans want a Southern R at the top of the ticket. Mm -hmm. Explain that further. Right, because, you know, this is the Southern Nevada, Clark County, Democratic stronghold, right? But if you can cut into that margin here, and we've seen him able to do that comparing relative to Cortez and Masto, those are harder votes for the Democrats to make up elsewhere in the state. Um, and that's what we're kind of seeing at the top of the ticket there. Even though last dumps in Washoe have been good for the Democrats there, you still see him running behind in Washoe, running behind obviously in the rurals pretty extensively. We've been talking about Clark and Washoe counties. Uh, what about Nye County? Jessica, I understand <laughs> after we finish taping, you're heading out there. And what's going on with them hand counting ballots, also using a tabulation machine? Right. So things have been kind of a back and forth. The Secretary of State's office uh, said, yes, you could hand count. But then uh, it was challenged. And then they're like, OK, no, you can't hand count, uh, at least before the election day, because of the way when before polls closed, uh, they were like they had a plan to read aloud the results with a live stream. And that's kind of, you know, you could be counting and you could decide who the winner is. Uh, so that was, you know, voted no, you can't do that. Um, however, now the hand counting will resume today on Thursday. Uh, they had some volunteers come in and get trained yesterday. And as far as we know, the process is underway. That sounds a little risky to have volunteers come in a day before. It'll be interesting. They did use uh, a machine to, uh, you know, tabulate the results and they sent that to the Secretary of State's. Uh, however, this is going to be really like an audit, you know, uh, second guessing, you know, trying to just double check the results of the machines to, you know, verify if they're the same. Uh, it kind of, uh, it'll be interesting to see what will happen when the hand counting does not match up with the <laughs> machine counting. Um, you know, some people say, will this give people who, you know, have uh, a little bit of hesitations about the process? will give them more confidence when they see, oh, actually, when I hand count, it's the same thing as the machines, maybe they're reliable. Or it could do the opposite, where you know it shows that maybe the machines aren't reliable in those voters' eyes. So it'll be interesting to see how that works out. How did election day go in Nevada in total? Have you heard any stories of problems at polls? It seemed like it was pretty smooth in terms of, I mean, you had long lines at certain places that are really, but that's not unusual, and you know, I think people just, tend to go to the same places to vote and there's lines and you know sometimes there's weather delays and things that push people back but I didn't hear of any sort of major um, issues or you know there was no uh, 
threats and sort of voter intimidation. That was something a lot of people were wondering whether or not we would see that, but that there didn't seem to be very many reports of that. So it seemed like it was pretty smooth. Just a few. Yeah. Senator mm -hmm. Catherine Cortez Masso tried to, she filed the lawsuit trying to keep the polls open longer. Uh, that didn't really work out, but. Uh, and what was her claim that. for that? Why was she arguing for that? There were some claims that people were trying to vote and then got turned away because the polls closed at 7 p.m. and they tried to vote, but they were turned away. And then from the other side, the Republicans tried to say what about Governor Sisolak and him uh, closing government offices? Yes, in northern Nevada, he closed some state offices because of the weather, and they tried to say, like, oh, he's prohibiting people's votes. Um, but that had nothing to do with polling locations. Those were all open. So. Weather, though, inclement weather does make a difference on Election Day, correct? Traditionally, it helps Republicans a little bit. Um, but, you know, now you have so many different ways. Um, <laughs> they, <laughs> they tend to be much more regular voters, um, tend to be older, more established, less transient. Um, all those things go into more likely to vote. Um, and you see that across the board, right? Republican turnout is always a little better than Democratic turnout. Um, and so weather is just another variable that goes into that. What about, oh, what were you I was going to ask? say, yeah, but it tends to have less of an effect in competitive races, mm -hmm. right? So mm -hmm. these are the types of races where people are, are, are already engaged and are enthusiastic to go turn out and vote. So in those types of races, like in Nevada, weather tends to have less of an uh, effect on turnout. What do we know about turnout so far for this election? Um, I mean, it depends how you, what you mean by turnout. <laughs> if you talk about raw numbers, it could be good, you can say it's good. If you're saying in terms of the percentage of registered voters, not very good. Um, in terms of voting el eligible population, I'm not sure. Um, so it kind of depends. I think overall turnout is, you would consider lower than say compared to the last midterm election, 2018. So that's one way of just comparing it to the last midterm. That was part of the blue wave uh, election cycle. So that had very high turnout in Nevada, and just comparing it to that, I mean, it seems like it's, it's not as good as that election cycle. Well, when did Nevada institute automatic voter registration? Because when we implemented automatic voter registration, now everybody goes to the DMV mm -hmm. and is registered, mm -hmm. so that total act like registered voters number shoots up, even though probably those people weren't going to vote anyway because they never planned to vote, you yeah. know? Um, so I think that might be skewing right. some of so the Right, so that's numbers. the thing. It is apples yeah. and oranges. Yeah. So voter turnout, for instance, in 2018 was around 60%. And Clark County, to think about Clark County, this so far, like before counting all these mail-in ballots was at 45%, huge discrepancy. But again, the, the, uh, denom the denominator's different, mm -hmm. right? Because now we have all these you know, automatically registered voters that are in there. So it's gonna be lower, right? Um, but still 45% is pretty low. And that was the question is, okay, well, how many mail-in ballots are out there? So people started calculating stuff out. I mean, you mentioned a number, like some people thought maybe 200,000. So actually, yeah, if you think that voter turnout should be 60%, this election cycle as well. That is a 200,000 ballot difference, right? Mm -hmm. So I think that's where some people are getting that number. But again, different apples to oranges. Um, so it's kind of hard to compare, but in general, like it is, it seems a little lower than 2018. The other point to remember here is you have about a half million people in Nevada who are age eligible who aren't registered at all, hmm. right? Oh. So that, you know, with political scientists, we tend to look at that age eligible number, right? And that drives down that turnout. Um, quite a bit as opposed to just looking at the registered number. So we do have to wait for the mail-in ballots to come to determine mm -hmm. voter turnout for accurately. Mm -hmm. um, the state of Nevada in general, how do we do? Voting? We're below national average. Even as much money in comp competitive hours races are, we generally fare lower than the national average in terms of voter participation. And what is the reason behind that? Um, people don't move here to become civically engaged. Um, they come here to make money. Um, but you have a very transient population. You have a, particularly in Clark, tilts a little bit under. You have a large immigrant population, right? Education level is very low. All the sort of things that we think drive turnout systematically, we tend to be on the lower end of those. Let's talk about those provisional ballots because, well, I would like to find out how much of a difference you think they could make. But first off, what are they, April? Uh, so provisional, someone might have a better explanation than me, <laughs> Jessica might. Uh, provisional ballots are, um, so if you went to the voting booth and you tried to vote but you weren't in the voter rolls for some reason or there's some kind of issue, then you can cast a provisional ballot that says, I would like to cast my ballot on election day because I have to cast it by, by election day, but then I will 
figure out the ID issue later, or I will like prove my identification. I'll prove that I'm eligible to vote after election day, but I'll put my ballot in first. So that's kind of, uh, yeah, that's. And yeah. what are we hearing about how many are out there? Uh, I think Joe Gloria said the other day that it was like at least 10,000, um, mm -hmm. but he wasn't sure the exact number, I believe. Okay. Uh, but that will take time to mm -hmm. you know, verify and get all those sorted out. In 2020, those broke for Republicans as well. I wonder why. <laughs> they had a better operation in 2020 than the Democrats. Democrats were late in the game getting their, their, their GOTV out there. That's mm -hmm. how uh, uh, Buck won her Senate seat on those um, provisional ballots. Right. And these are also all in person voting. So you can't mail in a provisional ballot. So again, that, you yeah. know, could you that Republican lean of these provisionals? And if we're talking 10,000 ballots, how significant could that be? Uh, I mean, there's like 80,000 mail ballots, so <laughs> comparatively, you know. <laughs> You're talking about in Clark County. Yeah, in Clark County or okay. whatever. So, um, you know, if you got extra, yeah. And it may matter down the down ticket, yeah. right? I mean, perhaps not, we might see the effect at the top of the ticket, but in some of those very tight uh, assembly races and state senate mm -hmm. races, right, that you can see that, making that's what exactly what happened in 2020. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's like a 300 number difference between two candidates in mm -hmm. assembly, so it should be interesting. And in terms of delay, how are how are the provisional ballots impacting that? I mean, I don't think that there will be too much more of a delay with the provisional ballots. I mean, there's already a delay. Well, not really a delay, but there's, you know, it's already taking long. Mm -hmm. So I don't think the provisional ballots will take much longer. But they do take extra steps to mm -hmm. process. Right. And uh, there's already the curing process, mm -hmm. too. Will so. you talk about that, the curing process? Yeah, so basically if um, you turn in your mail-in ballot, if the signature does not match what the department has on file, they'll uh, reach out and contact you and you'll have to come in and just talk to them and prove that, you know, that was me that submitted that ballot. Um, and that takes a little bit of time too. But Clark County's curing process is, is pretty solid, it seems like. I think there's like an electronic way to do it and there, you know, I think it's, it's luckily not too hard. It is an extra step, but for voters, it, it's a pretty good step, it's not. That was the subject of a lawsuit as well, right? Who would monitor those? Yeah. Who would monitor the curing process? Mm -hmm. Any talk about let's improve this process so that we get results quicker or does anybody, <laughs> do any lawmakers care? Um, you know, it's one of those things that comes up every two years, right? So it's a hard thing to invest in a lot of government resources, right? It reminds me when I go to the legislature, it's like, well, why don't there more staff here to write bills? It's because well, it's a really specific skill, <laughs> right? And once you train someone to do it, it's over. <laughs> so you have that and then you have these people, your, your, uh, your employees, and what do they do for the rest of the year? So I think that that, that, that tension there, but I think, you know, the, the degree that we're going to keep mail balloting and the administrative structure catches up to it, I think we'll get a little bit smoother. But, you know, if we're going to allow four days after, we're not going to get our results in close races until, you know, we get that past that four days at a minimum. There's like a balance between, I think, uh, access and um, quick turnout or quick processes. You know, the way the process is now, it's so easy to vote here. Anybody could just get their mail-in ballot, turn it in on election mm -hmm. day. They could show up not registered on election day, get registered and vote. So it's so easy to vote and that in the same time, it does make it a little bit harder to get a turnout really fast. With how close the Senate race is right now in Nevada. Uh, again, this is Thursday, two days after the election. I think Laxalt leads about 16,000 votes. With it being that close, we've got tens of thousands of ballots estimated to still be coming in. Anybody anticipate a runoff like what we're seeing about to happen in Georgia? Well, Georgia's is mandated, right? If someone doesn't get the 50%, there's going to be an automatic runoff there. Um, I think what Nevada, the statute is 0.5% is an automatic one, then someone can pay for it. Or, mm -hmm. or, oh, or a recount. Or a recount, recount um, as opposed to the, to the runoff. I don't see that happening. Anybody differ on opinion on that? No. No. no I think we're all thinking that uh, Cortez Masto is going to pull ahead as mm -hmm. we count these mail-in ballots. Yeah. Um, but different story for, for Sisolak, because he's down by 30 some thousand yeah. mm -hmm. uh, votes and that might be too much. Uh, but again, that kind of depends on you know, what Gloria is going to, the Clark County, you know, what they're going to say as far as how many mail-in ballots they've received from USPS today. Um, so again, things are, we're, we're not 100% sure. We're kind of guessing right now, but these are, I think, are all of our best guesses. Uh -huh. Are we able to tell what issues ended up getting people to the polls thus far? 
Well, I think clearly you have, you know, a lot of criticism, the Democrats hammering the abortion issue. That made a difference. I think election integrity made a difference, right? And those numbers, I think, played to the youth vote. And that came out a little mm -hmm. bit stronger. I think a lot of people participate, anticipated. Um, but, you know, so there's always that tension between the economy here. But if you look at sort of the Republican message, they didn't have a fix for inflation. It was just sort of a point the finger, and like, what are we going to do to fix it? We never okay. sort of heard that part of it. Um, I think the crime was, certainly the Republicans pushed that, but it's a little hard when you have the sheriff of the biggest <laughs> county as your gubernatorial <laughs> candidate to make that case. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Right. So I think, yeah, it's like the economy and abortion, right, seem to be the driving issues. And we, we kind of mm -hmm. saw that the entire campaign. Um, and yeah, and, but the question that we had was, is an issue like abortion strong enough of an issue to really mobilize the Democratic base? And it seems like it might have. And this is not also just looking nationwide, mm -hmm. right? Just looking at that, there really wasn't the red wave people were expecting. Uh, I mean, we can go into details of like what might have contributed to that, but one is more Democrats maybe turned out to vote than was expected you know, mm -hmm. because of uh, abortion. And in a lot of states, they had um, you know, initiatives uh, to protect abortion, right? So that helped, like for instance, I think in Michigan, mm -hmm. uh, hel helping uh, uh, Whitmer win re-election as governor there. So I think, yeah, you saw abortion as an issue that maybe isn't a winning issue for Republicans, taking a hard line uh, pro-life position because a lot of moderate Republicans don't necessarily feel that way and a lot of independents really don't feel that way. So um, it might have been an issue that really hurt Republicans nationwide. We have run out of time, but thank you so much for all of your input and thank you for joining us from wherever you are watching for the latest election results. Visit VegasPBS.org slash Nevada Week.